about uh, only about uh, few patients go into DHF. So, so that what we want as outcome in this uh, from the guideline as well as from our management, the most important thing is reduction in the case fatality rate of DHF and DSS. And also, we want to reduce the severity and the complications of DHF and dengue shock syndrome. That means at the end, we don't want to see deaths or red shock fluid overload any organ failure. So now we will look at the differences between the DF and DHF. As you all know, there is a febrile phase, straight away it goes into convalescent phase in a DF. That is the febrile phase lasts for about two to seven days and the convalescent phase is about two to five days without any critical phase. But if we look at the dengue hemorrhagic fever, there is a febrile phase before it enters into convalescent phase, we know there is a phase called critical phase, which lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. At times it can last longer than 48 hours, but most of the time it is in infants or children, it can be even less than 48 hours. But the earliest we commonly see, earliest uh, time of leaking is about day three. So during this critical phase, we have cons we almost always see plasma leakage. But in addition to that, the, these patients are having tendency to bleed. So we have to keep in mind that. And the convalescent phase lasts for about two to five days. So the difference between DF and DHF, as you can see, the critical phase is present in the DF. So the febrile phase is going to be the same for both. So it is very difficult to differentiate at the beginning. Therefore, all should be closely followed up in order to identify the DHF patients. So if we look at the clinical features or the difference between DF and DHF in shortened form, clinically similar in the first few days, that is during the febrile phase, I'm not going to describe the features which are given in the, uh, in the guidelines. And they both can have hemorrhagic manifestations due to capillary fragility. So there can be bleeding, mucosal bleeding, petechiae, those things. And also tourniquet tests can be positive in both. But the leukopenia, which is we see below 5,000, usually after second, third day, at the beginning, it can be normal or it can be slightly elevated. Thrombocytopenia, is uh, we are talking about less than 100,000 platelets, can be seen in even in dengue fever, that is about 50% of the cases. But in DHF, we see 100% of the time. If a patient has a tender hepatomegaly, which favors DHF, because sometimes we see this after ingestion of uh, NSAIDs and all that, therefore it favors DHF. But the plasma leakage is seen only in DHF. So how do we diagnose during the febrile phase? First of all, high index of clinical suspicion. Any child who comes with acute fever and some of the clinical features, the respiratory symptoms are not very common, but nowadays we see because there are so many children with upper respiratory and respiratory symptoms. GIT symptoms can be present, something like diarrhea, abdominal pain, or vomiting. And if there's a family history or neighbors having dengue, still we have to have a high index of suspicion. So the full blood count, the first full blood count we commonly or we recommend on completion of 48 hours from the onset of fever. At that time, most of the time, we will see leukopenia, which is less than 5,000. Uh, and platelet can be normal during the first few days. But if you look at the platelet count after three, third or fourth day, start dropping. Therefore, we advise on serial full blood count to diagnose dengue. Then NS1 antigen rapid test for dengue, which is now freely or common, it's available. It is very useful during the febrile phase. This is now we have included in the new guideline uh, about the importance of this test. But CRP, commonly we do it. It can be normal, but remember, it mild to moderate rise can be seen in most of the patients. So these are the simple investigations we do it to diagnose the uh, diagnose 
So if we look at this uh, NS1 antigen, which you can see in the, the sensitivity is very high during the first few days of the illness, especially. And after that, it comes down. It is a surrogate marker for virus in the blood. So negative report, remember, negative report does not exclude dengue infection. But if it is positive, it's very highly since uh, specific for dengue hemorrhagic dengue fever not dengue hemorrhagic fever it's for dengue infection also you can see in this slide the primary infection very commonly you can see here the ns1 can be positive for a longer period but if we look at the secondary infection it's positive only for a short period so and the viremia may be more severe in the primary infection so most of the time we get positive reports in dengue fever primary infection of dengue infection. So that is very useful. Nowadays it is available, but the state sector, it may not be available, but so it is good to do a, uh, if available, it's good to do a, a NS1 antigen with the first full blood count when we do it after 48 hours. So when it comes to management as outpatient during the febrile phase, adequate rest is indicated. So. If the child is unwell, not to send them to school or anywhere, please keep them at home. And the paracetamol, generally we advise about 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram, four times a day. The maximum dose is 60 milligram per kg per day. So we have to reassure the pa parents that this paracetamol dose is given for fever and pain. It makes only the child to be comfortable. Fever may not come down to 37 degrees. It's okay to have fever, so not to worry and not to seek for other medications. Especially, never prescribe NSAIDs like mefenemic acid, aspirin, this, uh, the ibuprofen, or steroids, because these can cause increased liver damage as well as bleeding manifestations. So it has to be avoided or not to prescribe this. But Medications like uh, antiemetics like domperidone, ondansetran, or some drugs like uh, H2 receptor blockers can be used if the patient has symptoms. Again, the oral hydration is important during the febrile phase. We don't need to give hourly because sometimes parents try to give hourly. Six to eight times per day, my maintenance fluid can be given. What to give? ORS foam made solutions or king coconut water rather than pure water. And the light diet can be taken and the young children, we encourage them to continue breastfeeding. So now with the first full blood count, now we repeat the full blood count. When the platelet count is more than 2,000, 200,000, we can repeat it daily. If it is between 150,000 to 200,000, twice a day. But the clinical judgment is very important because if the platelet is dropping very, very rapidly or if the child is ill, we may have to decide what to do, whether we are going to do a repeat the full blood count or the patient is going to need. I'm not going to go through these things. These are warning symptoms. We need to tell the parents and if these symptoms are present, they have to return immediately or they have to return for admission. These are clearly given in the guidelines. You all know you can go through this. So if these symptoms, so usually in the hospitals, we have a leaflets during the epidemic or when we have an increased caseload, we have leaflets. We tell them to read. And if they have these signs, they should return immediately to the hospital, irrespective of their count or the day of the illness. When they come with the lab reports, we also have to look for any features to suggest DHF or severe dengue. So rather than just looking at the report, it is very important to look at the patient. The clinical assessment is important. So there are features like lethargy, abdominal pain, generalized or right, right hypochondrium. Bleeding, including menstruation, if there is a tender hepatomegaly, if there is a rising PCV, platelet count. If you have the facilities to do uh, ultrasound scan at the point of care, we can even do ultrasound. But don't forget to look at the peripheries 
count the pulse volume cold or warm crft uh, these are very important vital signs to diagnose shock at any so the parents also need to be aware about the warning symptoms and we also need to be aware of warning signs in the outpatient setup so when are we going to admit these children so all patients with platelet count less than 150000 should be admitted if we see any increase in hematocrit more than 10% or around 10%, again, these children should be admitted. All patients with warning signs or symptoms need to be admitted. So high-risk patients, especially infants, obese children, or if they have a major more, more associated to, because it will be easy for us at any time, we, if necessary, we can go ahead with the IV fluids. The same management I mentioned in the outpatient department has to be continued while in the ward. On admission, if we think the patient is dehydrated, correct the hydration. And after that, reduce the infusion rate once the hydration is corrected. When I say where hydration is corrected means even the urine output if the child has more than one ml per kg per hour, then we can say reasonably the hydration is adequate. So then we can reduce. Yeah. Uh, so if patient is unable to take orally or poor intake, we can use 5% dextrosin, 0.9% sodium fluoride. That is the solution recommended for children. And the PCV, depending on the patient's situation, either you can. Got disconnected. Can you hear me? Madam, we can hear you. We just can't see the slides anymore. Zoom, but he's connected. I think. I'm sorry, there's a small issue, uh, so we are trying to sort it out. Just uh, give us a second. Okay, I'm sorry, there was some technical problem. We'll restart. So inward management, as I told you, uh, we continue the same outpatient management. If the patient is dehydrated, we have to correct the hydration and reduce the infusion rate. So PCV and full blood count has to be done regularly. It depends on the patient's clinical condition. Either two, three times you can do the inward PCV during febrile phase or more often if necessary. So now while we are monitoring these patients in the critical phase, how do we detect critical phase? The early detection, the, when the platelet count is closer to 100,000, 100, it can be in DF and DHF. But if it is DHF, that is the time usually the patients enter into critical phase. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to look at our monitoring chart, whether there is any decreasing urine output 
and gradual rise in PCV. So if towards 20% baseline, when we talk about 20% baseline, now if we take an infant, it can be 30 to 36, because if their hemoglobin is 10, the PCV is around 30, 30 to 36, or 35 moving towards 42, or 40 moving towards 48. So usually under 12 years, we consider 42 as the commonly, if we don't have a baseline, as leaking possible. Right. So now, so this you can see in your monitoring chart, but sometimes you may not see this uh, PCV changes because if we give too much fluid, we may not see the PCV rise. Or if the patient has an ongoing bleeding, again, the PCV may not be there. A rise of PCV may not be there. So we need to be careful when we interpret the PCV. But the, the objective way to diagnose plasma leak is ultrasound scan of the abdomen and chest. But if it is negative, we may have to do serial scans. If it is positive, then we can consider this as a plasma leakage. Usually, this plasma leakage will not tell us the timing of the starting point of leaking. So we need to be careful about timing. So it only says there is evidence of plasma leak. If we do a serial scan, sometimes we may, we may be able to tell. Even if the scan is negative, no, or no significant rise in PCV, use your clinical judgment to decide whether a patient has a severe dengue or not. Because sometimes the negative scan may lead to false security. We think sometimes the patient is not leaking, but the patient can, be, uh, ha can have a severe dengue. So at this point, this is very important slide. So we need to detect critical phase early, then we can move on to the critical phase chart, which is more often, more, uh, most of the parameters we monitor hourly. So from now onwards, I will hand over this to Dr. Lakuma to continue with the management of uh, critical phase, especially the fluid management and monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, uh, for that concise presentation on uh, the management of febrile phase, as well as the diagnosis of dengue and dengue hemorrhagic fever. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lakuma Fernando. So he is the clinical head of the Center for uh, Clinical Management of Dengue and Dengue Hemorrhagic Fever in Igambo. Um, or to you, sir. So. I have shared the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, just give me a second. Can you see Prasad? Uh, yes, sir. I have. Uh, can you see my uh, presentation on? Yes, yes, sir. We can hear as uh, uh, hear you as well as see. The yeah, we can see. You can see. You can see now. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, as you say, uh, this is a. Uh, I mean, fluid therapy is, a, is generally a uh, major part of dengue, but I'm I'm just touching <laughs> on a few things, hoping that the question time because all of her, all most of the people who have joined here are people who have a lot of experience in uh, managing dengue and uh, maybe uh, so most of the, the the issues that they have I hope that we will uh, sort out or try to answer during the question time so this is actually the consensus guideline of the SLCP 2023 consensus guidelines and says that the people who are in the uh, guideline committee agreed uh, on what is printed in the guideline and that's how it became the consensus guideline. And I'm just trying to put a few of my insights from the bedside. As a person who has been involved in the management of uh, dengue 
on an everyday basis for the last 156 months. These are the two places that I uh, my experience come from. I also have not uh, put the Gampa Hospital. This is our uh, Nigamba Hospital and the, the, the unit. Uh, now, if you really look at the, the story of uh, dengue that when we think of, that we have actually come a very long way. Uh, that uh, from 1989, when I was an intern, we had a case fatality rate of 9.8%, but 2021, it was 0.06, which is uh, almost 100 to 200 fold reduction. And if you take the 2009 epidemic, there were 35,000 cases and 350 deaths, and we have only uh, 20 deaths for the first 35,000 cases this year, which means 19 out of 20 patients who died in 2009 now survive. So we, we have come a long way with a lot of success, but it is this is still not enough. This is our dengue unit, and probably we are heading for another dengue epidemic that we have. That is why the, the, the question time is important. This was 2017, the male medical ward of uh, Nigam Hospital, where it was 80 bedded and there were 250 plus patients. This was the female medical ward, and these are the children's ward where we could. I was not uh, in the hospital at that time. I was in in Gampa, but I was looking out of the dengue unit, and the, the pediatric ward had to keep only the DHF till about three patients in one bed. So you know that DF, DHF, the main difference is the the lack of uh, critical phase in DF. And uh, DHF is a transient plasma leakage through the capillary walls, which happens only to the pleural and the peritoneal cavities for a period of not more than 48 hours. I heard Shantini said our, our guideline also says that it can be sometimes uh, more than 48 hours, but for all practical purposes, uh, uh, I would think it is good for you to think that it doesn't go beyond 48 hours. And my uh, general impression, having managed uh, Many thousands of uh, patients. I also believe that the that it very very rarely rarely goes beyond 48. So it is uh, so the volume loss in uh, in the intravascular compartment that happens during leaking can lead to shock and organ hyperperfusion. When there is organ hyperperfusion, there is lack of blood supply, especially when there is a uh, when there is a hemodynamic compromise. The body will try to uh, supply the vital organs. Uh, by uh, sending less blood to the splenic circulation that produce liver ischemia and gut ischemia. And if there are any, any necrotic areas or if somebody has given NSAIDs and there is an erosion, you can have, high, have less uh, perfusion to that area and necrosis and bleeding. And leaking, uh, I heard Shantini saying that the earliest time, yes, it is earliest time is, time is three, but having seen a large number of patients, I have seen a few, uh, who are, who lived as early as uh, day two, and uh, sometimes as late as day seven. So that's that's also possible. And uh, when it comes to the the objective diagnosis of leaking, we talked in the guideline about various things. I noted that we still have not got rid of the cholesterol that we talked about. I think we don't do cholesterol now, uh, and the and the we should stick to because we want dengue to be managed in places where there is a pediatrician and when there is an ultrasound DHF. Uh, if, you have, if you suspect DHF, those patients should be managed in a place where there is ultrasound. So currently, the limited ultrasound scanning of the chest and abdomen is the most objective way of diagnosing DHF in the clinical setting. And routine ultrasound is now uh, standard in, in, in Sri Lanka's dengue management. We started this in Nigambo in 2012, but we couldn't agree to put it into the into the 2012 December guidelines, uh, but until we had more experience during the 2017 epidemic, this is how our dengue unit had thousands of uh, patients lining up for, for to do ultrasound scanning. Uh, now, when to do the ultrasound scan? I think the when platelet count is dropping towards or uh, and beyond 100,000 100, is the time to do uh, scanning. When there is a very big drop, sometimes the patient's platelet count may uh, By the time you uh, do it at 6 o'clock in the morning, the patient was at 8 o'clock, maybe it has already gone. When they said, uh, sometimes I live above 100,000. I've seen a few patients. I've seen a patient who leaked as early as we objectively proved by doing counts before and after and doing serial. 
ultrasound, there was one child of, of, of many thousands. The, the dengue unit of many, now 13,000 patients inside the dengue unit, of which we had a child who leaked at 230,000. So occasionally, whenever you have a, a, you have a hemodynamic uh, instability or a rapid drop, all features, clinical features suggestive of uh, leaking, you should uh, try and uh, look for leak. In the, the looking at the leaking through uh, ultrasound is taking only about uh, five minutes once you train yourself. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to keep repeating. This is one of the publications of us on ultrasound. So once DHF is identified, then avoiding shock is easy. The, the best way, I think, is to avoid shock is our guideline also says, the new guideline introduces the 30 millimeter uh, pulse pressure. This is not something which is the I1 in the APLS, APLS guidelines, but if you if you try to maintain a, a shock is below uh, below 20 uh, millimeters mercury, and if you can make it at 30 uh, all the time, then you can uh, uh, prevent shock. And uh, these are some of the pictures that I have taken working with the dengue unit at different times. Uh, we have patients, infants to uh, uh, old uh, people of all ages, but the pulse pressure above 30 is uh, 30 is same to all. And the other important thing I want to tell you about uh, dengue is that if you have a dengue patient whom you are managing, a DHF patient whom you are managing, who has a tachycardia, that should be the most worrying uh, uh, clinical sign or clinical parameter that you you have. I mean, next to the the low pulse pressure, even if the pulse pressure is very good. If you have a tachycardia, please don't ignore that. And just see whether the, there is fever or excitement if, when the patient is talking or when if the patient is asleep, uh, still there is tachycardia. Uh, look at type of hypocalcemia. So you can give empirically some calcium while uh, taking blood to check calcium. But always think of the, we, this is This is very, very, during an epidemic time, it is, uh, it is common. I have uh, two patients uh, three patients actually at the moment. One patient we have uh, given to uh, from Monday to Monday to today. Uh, we have I have three patients who are who are bleeding and who had to be given uh, blood uh, twice. Uh, the second patient is just having a, 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 at the moment uh, going through a, uh, is an adult who is going through a blood transfusion. There was a there was a patient whom I shared the picture with uh, Chaturanga on Monday, an infant of. Uh, uh, three months who had to be given uh, blood twice. So whenever you have a tachycardia, then hematocrit, uh, it is a, it is an important thing to differentiate DF from DHF and then decide on the fluid therapy. Uh, when you think of uh, doing uh, the hematocrit, it's a key decision making in, in fluid therapy and capillary is better than venous. If you look at the guideline, the guideline will tell, stick to one of these, either capillary or, or or venous, uh, capillary is, is safer with regard to causing sepsis. Uh, and um, if you do, uh, it is uh, except in shock. When there is shock, of course, your capillary, if you, capillary PCV can be wrong. Uh, the frequency of doing PCVs depends on uh, the clinical condition of the patient. Uh, so maintain, uh, we have recommended to do it kind of uh, every six hours or so in the guideline in general. The maintaining of the urine output of 0.75 is another uh, new thing that has come to this guideline. Earlier, we talked more about 0.5. I think we un understand that the maintaining a good urine output is, 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 a, is a very important thing. Then when it comes to uh, low urine output, low urine output is also one of the commonest causes of, uh, causes of fluid overload, un uh, unfortunately, because uh, Sometimes when you when all the other parameters are good, other parameters are good, but if your urine output is the only one that is not good, especially you have no tachycardia, your pulse pressure is 35, 40, but you haven't had a urine output, good urine output. One other thing that you could do is again, I will touch on this when during the question time, is to use uh, frosimide, uh, a very, very tiny dose of frosimide. Uh, but you should know uh, how much of fluid you have given. If you are given a lot uh, enough fluid, which is uh, on a, on a time scale is is uh, you are given enough fluid, then you can try your frosimide. And uh, for that, you need to. I am asking you to count the amount. Or don't don't just keep giving fluid. Uh, please keep 
keep counting the volume that you have given and also knowing uh, the duration. Also, the other important thing is that when we have uh, your natural platelet counts, we hardly give platelets these days rising. Uh, uh, you should just think that uh, uh, that 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 patient is uh, is leaking is over. So that's that's another important parameter to see whatever the duration, whether you wanted to go for 48 hours or or whatever we thought that you are going to be, but you suddenly see after 20 hours or whatever 18 hours or maybe 30 hours. The platelets are rising. Uh, though there are effusions, and even sometimes the effusion levels are going up, uh, you have to think that the leaking is over. over. Uh, uh, this is the fluid quota that you know. Then we also introduce into the guideline about the weight for fluid quota. The ideal body weight is the 50th centile. So that when the actual body weight uh, is less than the ideal body weight, uh, we have to use the the actual body weight. Then we talked about adjusted body weight for very big and heavy. That is, especially if you are if you are fat and tall, not really fat only. Sometimes your weight may be, your maybe just uh, your height may be may be in the 10th uh, centile, but your weight may be uh, about 90th centile. So those patients, you, I think the the ideal body weight is good enough. But if you are heavy, if you are if you are tall and heavy, Big weight, then you should use the adjusted body weight, which is given in our, our guideline. Now, um, I said the, the the leaking almost never exceed 48 hours, can be as short as 6 to 8 hours or mostly uh, 24 to 48 hours. If your leaking is less, uh, you oh, might not need the full amount of fluid. You probably need proportionately less amount of fluid. So, um, as I told, 99% of the time, when two consecutive platelets are rising, your leaking is over. I think everybody will leak only for 24 hours when you want to give fluid. And uh, if you uh, try to use only half of the uh, fluid quota or less than half of the fluid quota, and look for parameters and see uh, whether the patient is continuing to leak before con before uh, uh, continuing to give, give fluid. And the rate of leaking is uh, variable from patient to patient. Uh, we know uh, that it comes in a form of an ascending and a descending uh, way. That is, the leaking gradually increases and and gradually go down. Uh, pre our previous guideline, we tried to tell. Uh, of course, we just uh, copied uh, uh, something from uh, from Thailand. And even in this guideline, I was one of the the, the biggest contributors. And we we said that we could keep increasing the fluid uh, so that now we have taken off this, this from our new guideline. We just say that there is an ascending limb, descending limb, equilibrium and reabsorption phase. And uh, 1.5 ml is what uh, we, could, uh, we could start uh, to give uh, fluid. And you can uh, increase the amount of rate of fluid according to the guideline based on uh, the clinical parameters. So that's, that is what he said. And my personal experience is two thirds of the patient can be managed from beginning to end without ever increasing only with the 1.5 ml rate. So in summary, that the fluid that what you need to give is when you're above 150,000, you can just maintain your normal urine output and uh, just give the normal uh, free oral fluid. And when you are below 150,000, that we have to think that you are a potential leaker. And when you're coming towards 100,000, that you have to restrict fluids and start with 1.5 and then go on. The fluid that we can use are a normal cell line, Hartman. Uh, Hartman. Normal cell line in 5% dextrose is the most recommended fluid. And then as the colloid, uh, only dextran. Uh, earlier, we used to use 6% starch. And if there is bleeding, blood. And uh, in our guideline, the, we, we tell about using dextran uh, 10 ml per kg per, per one hour. Uh, but it also says that the extent can be given for less than maximum, uh, that is a maximum period of one hour. We haven't talked about a half bolus in the guideline uh, because it was not uh, kind of, this, as I told you, it's a consensus guideline. But I will say that we can use a half uh, bolus at the same rate of 10 ml per kg, but not given for one hour, so half an hour. So the total volume will be five, five ml per kg. Uh, but given no half an hour, so the rate is 10 ml per kg. The usefulness of our bolus is time to time when we have dextran shortage, it is useful. 
the other thing is that sometimes the decision to give dextran may, may be may be a little uh, doubtful so if you are in doubt that you can actually uh, do uh, less harm if you give a half bolus than a, than a full bolus in my practice uh, 95 percent of the dextran that we use are half boluses so if the patient comes in shock what are the possibilities and how to give fluids uh, if you you can if a patient is already dehydrated the patient may with a little amount of leaking you can get uh, shock uh, very early but classically most patients as the guideline describes go into shock after about 24 hours of leaking but also there can be a very slow leaker who will leak uh, without even maybe at home and leak and uh, the, uh, say out of the critical phase 90 80 percent of the critical phase he'll go through uh, go through and uh, he's with, his, with his own fluids and may go into shock only at the last end. So uh, you might not need fluid for another 24 hours. If you give 24 hours of fluid, then the fluid reabsorption will cause you fluid overload. So that also has to be has to be kept in mind. So coming in shock could be a dehydrated patient, mild or early leaking, or a severe or a rapid leak, or a classical DHF or a slow leak. And what you need to do is to give uh, start if a patient comes in shock to start on 20 ml per kg bolus as fast as possible until pulse is well felt, and then uh, once the pulse is well felt and your pulse pressure goes above uh, 30, then switch to 10 uh, ml per kg while taking a blood for PCV. Continue that for one hour and repeat the hematocrit. That will tell you the story what exactly is happening when this patient is bleeding, when this patient is dehydrated this patient is a classical leaker or so going by those values but once if you give uh, even after doing this that if there is once you give 20 ml per kg of uh, kg of fluid now I, I told you start with the 20 ml kg but you, you can stop it halfway once the pulse pressure is okay but once you give the 20 ml still the pulse pressure is not good then you will have to switch to so you should extract uh, it is best not to give dextran to a dehydrated patient and you have to always give at least 15 to 20 ml per kg of fluid uh, crystalloids before starting on dextran, which is uh, the algorithm is given in the uh, guideline. Thank you. So that's that's all uh, from me, uh, Chaturanga. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for that informative presentation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, please type in your questions or if you have any okay, questions. Thank you. Then. At the end, you can ask questions. Okay. So our next presenter is, uh, of course, he doesn't need an introduction, Dr. Nalin Kitulata. He is the consultant in charge of the MIC of Lady Hospital. Uh, so over to you, sir. I think your mic is mute, Nalin. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. So uh, we are going to discuss about this uh, last part of this uh, three lecture series. Uh, my topic is managing complicated dengue, the challenges. Uh, so uh, we have seen several guidelines. The first one is 2010. The second one is 2012. As the previous speakers mentioned, so with these guidelines, we had better understanding, the mortality has reduced, the less ICU admissions, less complications. So they have done a lot. So this is the, uh, the LRH MICU admissions and death from 2010 onwards. You can see clearly that uh, the admission is to 157 in 2010 has reduced to 11 in 2022. Uh, so uh, this has done a lot. So, but when you uh, think about the causes of mortality, 
So this is the uh, analysis that we have done in our ICU. In 2009, most of the deaths were due to fluid overload and compartment syndrome. But from 2013 onwards, uh, the, the causes of deaths are overcautious fluid restrictions, which causing uh, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So uh, with this background, we have now revised the guidelines in 2023. So these are the complications that I have think about. So I have managed with uh, dengue with sepsis, dengue with nephrotic syndrome, dengue with uh, other comorbidities, dengue with fluid overload, dengue with multi-organ dysfunction, and HLH. So uh, if you think about the managing complicated DHA, or for that matter, uh, 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 preventing the complications in DHA, what I would say is stick to the basics. So. By doing that, you can prevent complications, you can manage complications. There's nothing much about this, but stick to the basics. So management of DHF is not try to give minimum amount of fluid. Management of DHF is not somehow try to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid during critical phase, but it is the maintaining the hemodynamics with minimum amount of fluid. I think you all can uh, understand the difference between the first two slides and this the, the third one. So our aim should be maintaining the hemodynamics, but not like in septic shock, not like in other conditions, we are bound. So we cannot use a lot of fluid. We have to do this with minimum amount of fluid, but our aim not, should not be somehow reduce the amount of fluid. We have to maintain hemodynamics somehow. So uh, these are the take home messages that I want to share with you all. So you can give minimum fluid in febrile phase, you can give minimum fluid in recovery phase, but just sufficient fluid in critical phase. I mean, not more fluid, not less fluid. It should be just sufficient fluid in critical phase, and you should not give unnecessary boluses. So that will increase your uh, pleural diffusion and SIC. So but if you can do this, you can treat shock, you can prevent shock, and by doing that, you can avoid organ damage. At the same time, you can prevent the fluid overload also. So if you analyze, these are the two main causes of deaths in dengue, fluid overload and shock or poor organ perfusion lead into multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So already we have discussed this, there are high risk patients. So we have to be very careful when you are managing these patients. The high risk means they can have complications at any time. So this slide is from Thailand, but they say is uh, uh, if you have prolonged shock, more than 10 hours untreated, death is inevitable. That doesn't mean that the child is going to die after 10 hours. This child will develop multi-organ dysfunction, liver failure, renal failure, multi-organ dysfunction, come into ICU, that die after two weeks. But the beginning of the, the course of death should be the untreated shock. So more than four hours untreated shock with liver failure, prognosis is 50%. Liver plus renal failure, prognosis is 10%. Three organ failures plus respiratory failure, prognosis is a miracle. So our aim should be somehow prevent shock, if not at least treat shock. So this we have already touched. So if you give more fluid in dengue, uh, fluid load will it happen. If you give less fluid, uh, it can cause uh, multi-organ dysfunction, prolonged shock, that those are the two main causes of death. So if you just sufficient, if you give just sufficient fluid in critical phase, you can prevent death as well as complications. So if you think about the fluid management, already we have touched, I'm just going to go through fast. So we have to give minimum fluid in febrile phase because we are not that worried about the amount of fluid in febrile phase. We have to give minimum fluid in recovery phase. Again, we are not that worried about the, uh, the fluid in recovery phase, but remember to give just sufficient fluid in critical phase. That means not more, not less, because that's the key. So how can you do that? So for that, we have to, concentrate about these four things. Identify the beginning of the leak, predict the end, try to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid during this time. Most important thing is please match the leak. If you are matching the leak, you are not giving more fluid, you are not giving less fluid. So already we have touched these things. If the platelets are less than 100,000, PCV is rising uh, towards 20%, that means more than 10%, poorly efficient, societies, if you are not sure, you can go for the albumin and cholesterol. So these are the uh, features that shows you that the child is in critical phase. This slide also you have seen. So, but I'm trying to concentrate on uh, something else. There are three phases, febrile, critical, and recovery phases. 
first concerned about the platelet count, platelets are dropping initially. When the patient is entering into the critical phase, platelets may be below 100,000. Still, platelets are dropping even in the recovery phase. Sometimes platelets are dropping and platelets are rising somewhere here. So if you think about, uh, look at the white cell count in uh, comparison to that, in that con comparison to the platelets, white cells uh, are initially dropping, but when the patient is entering into the critical phase, white cell count is rising. So if you have serial white cell count, you can quickly or very easily detect this point. Platelets are still dropping, white cell count is rising. So that's the beginning of the critical phase. So and this is the natural history. So we are talking about again, again, again. So uh, the critical phase or the leaking phase will start somewhere here. Then you have the ascending limb. Then maximum leak is around 24 hours. We are paying, most of the patients can go into shock. Uh, the shock can occur during this time. And then the, the descending limb, the leak will go down gradually and leak will stop by 48 hours. So this is what we call it critical phase, equilibrium and reabsorption. So uh, if you try to predict the end, what you have to do is, if the child is entering into the critical phase today till noon, we know that uh, till tomorrow till noon is my descend, uh, ascending limb. So maximum leak I'm expecting around tomorrow till noon. I'm expecting problems tomorrow till noon. Then leak will go down. We call it descending limb. The leak will stop by day after tomorrow till noon. So this mental picture should be there when you are managing a patient. So during this time, we are trying to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid. So these all these things are to avoid giving more fluid. So calculate your fluid for the adjusted body weight. This is uh, introduced, this new guidelines in obese children. Give only the amount needed to maintain hemodynamics, frequent monitoring and adjusting fluid, and don't give unnecessary boluses. So then we want to match the leak. So to match the leak, we are monitoring about six parameters, urine output, PCV, pulse volume, peripheral coldness, capillary refilling time, and blood pressure. Out of these, the only objective parameter that we have is urine output, because all the others are depend on your experience, depend on the, uh, the quality of the machine, depend various things. But if you have a catheter, if the catheter is not blocked, the urine output is 5 ml, should be 5 ml for me, you even for the bystander. So in this new guideline, we are aiming for 0.75 to 1 ml per kg power as our urine output. So that is important. Second important thing in this slide is please don't treat only one parameter. So we are measuring six parameters to get the holistic idea about the patient. So after measuring six parameters, if you are treating only one, that is ridiculous. So get the holistic idea and then try to manage. So about urine output, why we are measuring urine output? To get an idea about the tissue perfusion. In other words, to get an idea about the cardiac output. So when you are having low renal perfusion, your kidney will produce less urine. So when there is a low urine output, the treatment should be increased IV fluid. Please don't give frucimide because that will give you a false security. Uh, the kidneys will produce some more urine uh, irrespective of the uh, low intravascular volume. So that is very, very dangerous in some instances. So I have shown this slide. So this is the natural history of the, uh, the, the, the leakage. So if you are managing properly, if you are matching this uh, leakage properly, this should be our the fluid chart. If the child has presented with shock, that means this early part has already occurred at home. So we are starting our management somewhere here. So if you are managing properly, if you are matching the leak, this should be our fluid chart. They are in the guideline. So unfortunately, these are the fluid charts that we are seeing in ICU. So what is happening? I try to understand the treating physician's mentality. What they are doing, because they are so worried about the amount of fluid that we are giving, we are giving very small amount of fluid initially. All of a sudden, child needs a bolus. That means child went into the shop. So after giving the bolus, all the parameters are all right. Urine output is improving, pulse volume is adequate. So we think we have done a marvelous job and we are cutting down fluid back to 2 ml per kg. At least you have to remember this 2 ml is not enough. That is why this child has gone into shock. We have to give a little bit more fluid to prevent shock. So we are not doing that. In the next two, three hours, the next uh, uh, episode of shock, now we are giving dextran. We are doing the same thing, cutting down fluid. Another one, here, giving uh, normal saline, giving blood, and send it to ICU. This is what is happening. This is what, in, what I have seen, uh, what I'm seeing uh, every day, uh, every year, 
for last 10 years. Right. So what about bleeding? Already we have discussed some of these things. We have overt bleeding and concealed bleeding. Uh, management of bleeding should be with blood transfusion. So we have only pack cells, so it should be pack cells, not other blood products. Again, this is happening even now. After uh, going through this guideline for more than 10, 12 years, even now, some people are using other blood products, FAP, cryo, platelets. So they are not for uh, management of bleeding in dengue. So these are the indications of blood. If you see significant overbleeding, or if you are suspicion uh, of concealed bleeding, that means if the PCV is dropping without clinical improvement, that means there's something wrong. So you need blood. How to give blood? It should be packed cells. It should be 5 ml per kilo. That's again a misuse. Sometimes even in LRH, we have seen that we are giving 10 ml per kilo blood. 10 ml per kilo pack cells. Guideline is very clear. It should be 5 ml per kilo. And 5 ml per kilo blood will increase your uh, the hematocrit by five points. Hypocalcemia, again, is a common, is a cause of conversion in DHF. So we are using empirical calcium in complicated DHF and deteriorating DHF. Again, please don't give this on uh, all, all the patient DHF. We are seeing just after diagnosing DHF, oral calcium. So that is not clinical pediatrics. So dose is 10% calcium gluconate, 1 ml per kilo, 10 ml is the maximum dose. Diluted in equal amount of uh, normal saline, you can give. Hyponatremia, again, is common. It's cause of conversion in DHF. So can cause cerebral edema and corning. So please use only isotonic fluid in DHF. Best fluid is normal saline with 5% dextrose. So, so what's new in 2023 guidelines? So most important differences in 2023 guidelines is fluid calculation in obese children and target urine output. We are discussing about three types of uh, body weights here, actual body weight, ideal body weight, adjusted body weight. What they are selling is, if your actual body weight is less than ideal body weight, use the actual body weight. If your actual body weight is slightly higher than the ideal body weight, use the ideal body weight. If your actual body weight is markedly higher than ideal body weight, use adjusted body weight. So the other important thing is whatever the weight that you are calculating, whether it's actual, ideal, or adjusted, should be same for fluid calculation as well as urine output calculation. You can't use fluid one way, uh, urine output another way. So if you think about the adjusted body weight, this is how you do it. It's 0.4 into actual body weight minus ideal body weight plus ideal body weight. So this is an example. Actual body weight is 48. Ideal body weight is 37. So adjusted body weight will be 41.4. So basically, it's coming in between actual body weight and ideal body weight. So that's why we have introduced this in markedly obese children. So golden rule is critical phase. Early detection of beginning and recognition of the end of the platelet, uh, the end of the a leakage is important, meticulous monitoring, matching the fluid administration to the leak, and anticipation, early detection and treatment of concealed bleeding and other complications. So the second difference, main difference is urine output target is 0.75 to 1 ml per kg per hour. So urine output should be calculated for ml per kg per hour for each void is the best guide to decide in the rate of fluid infusion, 0.75 to 1 ml per kg power is sufficient to maintain renal function. So you should not go less than 0.75. You should not go more than one. So that is why just sufficient fluid. So if you go through the shock management, I think this is important. This is very clear in the new guidelines. So we have shock. You can divide into compensated shock and uncompensated shock. But still think about the compensated shock. That is narrow pulse pressure or low volume pulse. You are giving normal saline bolus 10 ml per kilo or one hour. And you are reassessing. If there's a response, you are adjusting the rate according to the uh, your hematocrit, pulse, capillary refilling time, and blood pressure and urine output. Important thing is after giving 10 ml per kilo, please don't reduce it to 2 ml. It should be gradual. It should be 9, 8, 7, likewise. So you have to gradually reduce it. And if you have, after giving the normal saline bolus, when you are reassessing the child, there's no response. Still, child is in compensated shock you need a second bolus. Again, 10 ml per kilo or one hour, you are reassessing if there's a response, gradual reduction. If there's no uh, response, 
After the second bolus, then you have to give dexan. Dexan is 40, uh, dexan is 10 ml per kilo or one hour. So if you think about the uh, uncompensated shock, that means unrecoverable pulse of blood pressure, you are giving rapid bolus of normal saline, 20 ml per kilo free flow until pulse palpable or BP recordable. That means you are giving, uh, you are trying to give 20 ml per kilo uh, until you feel the pulse. Then you are reassessing. If there's a response at the end of 20 ml per kilo, then you are reducing it to 10 ml per kilo and gradually reduce the amount of fluid. If there's a response before 20 ml per kilo, again, you are stopping at that point and give 10 ml per kilo and then gradually reduce it. If there's no response, even after 20 ml per kilo of uh, a normal saline, go for dexan and reassess uh, after giving dexan. If there's a response, adjusting the fluid gradually. And if there's no response, even after the dexan, uh, you have to think about A, B, C, and S. That is acidosis, bleeding, calcium and alkaloids, and sugar, and manage accordingly. So in summary, so if there's a compensated shock, First bolus 10 per kilo normal saline, reassess. If there's no response, second bolus 10 per kilo normal saline, reassess. If there's no response, you dexan. If the uncompensated shock, 20 ml per kilo as a free bolus. Once you feel the pulse, go for 10 ml per kilo and gradually reduce it. After 20 ml per kilo, if there's response, do the same thing. Even after 20 ml per kilo, if there's no response, go for dexan. So it's very simple. This is mentioned in the guideline. So dexan is uh, uh, only during the critical phase. That is again important, and it should be given as a rate of 10 ml per kg per hour. So managing of fluid overload that is also important. So when you are managing fluid overload, intravascular volume status is crucial. So sometimes intravascular volume, uh, intravascular compartment may be depleted this, uh, despite the patient being in fluid overload. So if you have a fluid overload with depleted intravascular volume, fusimide alone is dangerous. So first give dextran, restore the intravascular volume, and then give fusimide. So if you're having a fluid overload with good intravascular volume, fusimide alone may be given. So just remember, they are very sensitive to fusimide, so dose should be smaller than the usual dose. But uh, advising is, 0.1 milligrams per kg as a bolus. You can repeat if necessary, but be careful. HLH, again, so uh, this is uh, not very common, but we have seen several cases of HLH in dengue. So it's a treatable if identified early. Mortality is very high if you had delayed the diagnosis, and you should suspect this ongoing fever with multi-organ involvement in dengue. So we know in dengue, usually when the patient in, is entering into critical phase, fever subsides. If that is not happening, think about HLH. Bone marrow biopsy is necessary for the diagnosis and treatment is with steroid, dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. Better to discuss with hematologists uh, and pediatric oncologists about this uh, management. So DHF in obese children, these are the key features. Fluid calculation for adjusted body weight. Urine output should be calculated for adjusted body weight. Catheterize early, consider colloid early, consider blood transfusion early, empirical calcium gluconate, and consider expert opinion early. So these are the common pitfalls. Not simulating natural cause of the disease. I have shown how to match the lead. Try to give minimum amount of fluid despite hemodynamic instability. Cutting down fluid just after blowless. Don't do that. Not try to prevent shock. Not giving blood early. Not sending the child to ICU early because ICU care is not fulminant care. So these are the two messages, minimum fluid in febrile phase, minimum fluid in recovery phase, don't give unnecessary bolsters, but please give just sufficient fluid in critical phase, not more, not less. If you do that, you can treat shock, you can prevent shock, and you can avoid organ damage, and you can prevent the fluid overload also. So those are the two main uh, causes for deaths and complications in DHF. So if you can prevent both, the child will go home. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. Very so now it is the time for questions and answers. So I hope Dr. Lakoma and Dr. Shantini Ganeshan are both on board. 
Uh, there are a few questions that has uh, been uh, entered into our chat book, so I will read them out. Um, so the first question is, how sensitive is the ultrasound scan in diagnosing the dengue leaking phase? So there are two parts of the question. Uh, if you see a typical pattern of fluid leaking in pericolecystic fluid, heparinal how confidently can we say it is dengue leaking? So basically, uh, he's asking how sensitive and specific uh, yeah, uh, is uh, ultrasound scan during the leaking phase. Uh, perhaps uh, Shantini Madam might be able to give an answer to that. Yes. Um, usually, the what we see, the difference between DF and DHF is uh, the fluid leakage. And especially when you say there is fluid in the pericolecystic fluid and the, this thing, it is very suggestive of DHF. There is no question. But just a gallbladder edema or thin rim of fluid, it can be even seen in DF. But if there is adequate fluid, like you see the fluid, that is indicative of DHF. I think it's very specific, right? If in a febrile illness, if someone has fluid leakage, you have to suspect uh, DHF or you have to diagnose DHF. It's very specific. Did I answer the question? Yeah, if uh, I am to add, I think if the, I'm the question to has the... been uh, put forward by Bimsara Berat. Bimsara, are you happy with the answer? If I can add, uh, Prasad, the, Lakma, sir, you have anything yeah, to come add? The, the radiologists, the radiologists say that. Uh, okay, so we move to the second question. Um, uh, this is Dr. Asanga Rajapaksha. Uh, uh, we have seen a rough guide which says that the timing of leaking may be judged by the areas of fluid leak detected by the ultrasound scan. Can you clarify whether it's not accepted? Uh, I think this came up while we were uh, developing the guideline whether ultrasound scan can be used to, to you know, properly time the uh, onset of leaking. Um, so, Adam, would you like to answer? Or, or? Yeah. I think uh, the problem with ultrasound scan is it says the leaking or objective evidence of leaking. You have to look at with the clinical picture and the platelet count to decide whether we are in the beginning of the leakage or end of the leakage. Even we may see some fluid at the, during the recovery. The platelet count may be 50,000, but still there can be fluids. So it has to be correlated with the clinical picture. But as Dr. Lakuma said, if you are doing serial scanning after even detecting the fluid, if you see the progression of fluid, then you can see the leaking is continuing. Or if there is less fluid, we may say. But usually in the ward setup, in a busy ward, we mostly use this ultrasound scan to detect leaking. So once it is detected leaking, once we detected leaking, we don't go on doing it in the normal wards. The reason is we are so busy and the new patients, but anyway, we are monitoring the patient. So until detecting the leak, we may do a serial scan. So it's very difficult only by looking at the, only by looking at the leakage, you can't time it. But if you see a massive effusion or a massive pleural effusion or ascites, then you may say this patient had been leaking for a longer period. I think that's why the radiologist also suggested not to include this timing into the guideline because this can mislead us. So it's mainly for detecting fluid. Can I add something? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, so I also agreed with uh, uh, Shantini. So what uh, the leaking can be detected by ultrasound scan, but timing, if you try to time the leaking with ultrasound scan finding, you will be misled. You will have problems. So please don't do that. If there's leaking, that means the child is in critical phase, child is in leaking phase, but you cannot time by doing ultrasound scan. The other important thing is just by having a little bit of fluid uh, in the uh, abdomen uh, in a febrile child, 
don't think it's only dengue. So there are other conditions, and even in a severe sepsis, you can see this type of leaking. So you have to be use your clinical judgment. It's not only ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan is a guide. So you are clinicians, go through the clinical history, examination, other investigations, and ultrasound scan uh, to come to the diagnosis and diagnose leaking. Thank you, sir. Lakshmi, do you have anything to add? I, I think uh, two, three things. One, when we have a, uh, if a, if a patient comes in shock, right? If a patient comes in shock, one of the key things that you can do if there is an ultrasound in the ETU emergency, uh, and while you are, you resuscitate, you can do if you do if you can do an ultrasound there, you can immediately know. Uh, that you may this patient could be the dengue, and of course nowadays if you have a uh, dengue antigen test kit uh, near you, which will take uh, literally twenty minutes, but in five minutes most of the time, if you do the test bedside, you know that uh, whether it could be dengue or not, depending on the days uh, of the illness. So most mostly, a lot of patients these days, uh, if they come early to hospital or if we, if we start managing them early, the platelet count doesn't matter. If, a, if somebody comes with a platelet count of, uh, say, 10,000 and you have got a left-sided pleural effusion, maybe a patient, you may be somebody who has recovered and uh, from dengue and the fluid dose they would have absorbed and the effusion may be just a remaining, uh, remaining effusion. But I think uh, there is, uh, medicine is more an art, it's not arithmetic. We should not have very uh, hard and fast rules to say, I always find uh, looking at the leaking, I mean, take for instance, the, the numbers that I, I manage is high if you really look at it. Just today, I have about 50 patients whom I'm seeing, uh, I'm, I'm seeing individually uh, at Nigambo, uh, that's uh, so when you when you see them, uh, I think the, the the when it comes to making all these uh, statements and decisions, uh, you you have to base them on your experience, right? So uh, probably two people cannot say say two people with two different experiences cannot be saying saying the the same thing. All what I can say is you can. It's a very useful thing for you to think how much the patient has, how, how long the patient has leaked, depending on the size of the effusion, the distribution, as well as the, as the uh, duration of illness and, and the platelet count. Because if, you, if, you, if somebody is having, a, uh, say, a pleural effusion and a platelet count is 50,000, likely this is only the right side the fluid some fluid in the right side, and then we do another one later, you will see that that diffusion size is increasing. So this is an, this is an ongoing patient. We will, we will put back uh, most of the time those who have uh, uh, big uh, plural effusions are people who may have leaked for maybe as long as, uh, say, 18 to 24 hours, right? So uh, it is, it is, a, it is uh, a useful thing, but you should always, uh, be ready to uh, change depending on the course, depending on what you what you see on a daily basis. Nowadays, most of the wards have ultrasound um, scans, right? Uh, of course, in in, in our, our both the the children's ward in Nigambo has all the medical wards in in has, so they are they can uh, sometimes scan the DHF. Uh, at the initial stage, once we have established that this is a DHF, probably this is the onset, then you don't have to do OC really. But maybe initially you have to do a few scans and then you have a good idea when this would have this patient would have started. Okay, thank you. So the confusion is the adult guidelines, they had a guide for this sort of uh, based on the ultrasound scan findings, uh, you know. You know whether it helps to time. No, we we included something with the help of the. If you really look at the uh, what do you call the guideline of dengue in pregnancy, this was done. These are the most recent guideline before our guideline. I was a contributor to this. We got down uh, a few radiologists also uh, into the making of this. So with that, uh, we have written something uh, again consensus 
on uh, on the timing i would say the it is uh, useful but there is no um, no hard and fast rule to say this is this this if you have this this is this, is, this number of hours and so on okay thank you sir the next question is i mean this has uh, been repeated several times now regarding uh, supplementation so we uh, supplement calcium uh, anti reflux medications then uh, vitamin e and also uh, on the same line whether there is any place for prophylactic antibiotics because uh, most of these patients will be neutropenic um the comment from our speakers i as a practice I, as a pra practice, use, uh, I mean, that is classic personal practice, use antibiotics in, uh, in all the patients uh, because uh, who are admitted, not in those who are at home, uh, who are admitted because if they, especially the DHF, if you have, if you are pricking them a lot, sometimes you might have to catheterize them. I did it uh, after starting our uh, Center for Clinical Management that has managed about 13,000 patients so far from we started in 2013. Uh, initially, we did not. Then we, we, we found that our, our, what you call, still I would say that our infection rates or the post infection rates are extremely low, but we could uh, make it low by uh, introducing the antibiotics. In, if you come to come to about use of antibiotics, I you know we should really be cautious. And if you ask the microbiologist, everybody will say I don't use unnecessarily. But uh, one of the things that you you will find about the use of antibiotics is that antibiotics reduce the hospital stay in uh, dead patients because uh, their secondary infections are patients are less. I use it as a personal practice, essentially in all patients. I cannot give up this practice because of the experience that I have. I know I won't go by somebody who will tell me with, with, with less experience not to use. Okay. Um, any comments about calcium? I think uh, Kitalatsa mentioned that uh, calcium should not be given empirically. Uh, Shantini, I think um, um, usually these supplements are not given. Uh, in our practice in the ward setup, if it is a patient who has a very high count or something like we are catheterizing, or if the patient comes with uh, other infections, we do give antibiotics. But uh, generally uncomplicated uh, DHF patients, grade one or two, I mean, we have to maintain a good uh, aseptic measures to prevent. So... In, my, in our practice, we generally don't use antibiotics or calcium supplements for the uncomplicated patients. Uh, obviously, if they are complicated, we give the calcium, or if the calcium is low, we give the calcium supplement or calcium gluconate, not as a prophylaxis, uh, empirical or treatment. But the antibiotics, as Dr. Lakuma said, uh, I have varying opinions. Uh, if it is a simple DHF grade one or two, according to the WHO, not gone into shock, not catheterized, not having any fever or CRP is very really normal because these patients are monitored very frequently. If there is a deterioration, if there is a worry, we start. That is my practice. I'm just uh, telling it's the ward practice. So. I suppose it comes down to the personal practice also. Um, okay, we'll move to the next question. Uh, uh, when we are calculating the urine output in obese babies, um, is it for actual weight or ideal body weight? I think that was addressed uh, uh, um, earlier by both uh, Lakumas and Nalin, so that we, we use adjusted body weight. It's a new concept that we have introduced in this guideline. Uh, this is an interesting question. Is there a limit for overall fluid volume for 24 hours? Uh, Lakumas briefly touched that you, know, you can use half of a maintenance plus 5%. Uh, is there a, is there like a, tell, me, uh, tell me tell tell me the question to the overall volume tell, tell me the question uh, tell me the question again hours. tell me the question again uh, tell me the question again uh, oh, sorry. Right, sorry. so the question is is there a limit for overall fluid volume for 24 hours 
that is for dhf or da i think he is referring to the first half of the leaking period that's well, it is a, uh, there is no no limit as such which is not there is a thing in this guideline which i myself use as as practice what is called uh, watts or what you call volume or uh, over time so we can uh, calculate uh, if you take for instance if you have a patient and say a 50 kilo patient for easiness whose total volume is 4600 uh, and if you use uh, 2300 or more say say 3000 you have used between the first 24 hours uh, and if the patient is continuing to leak likely that you will end up uh, going beyond the 4600 in other words what you say is that you are though you have not exceeded the fluid quota you are heading towards uh, fluid overload when you have this. so as a personal practice of course what i what i say is uh, is published in the international uh, in in the icid where we used uh, we use uh, 400 dhh uh, patients using analyzing the fluid rate with uh, professor patmeshwaran very carefully uh, about the fluids that we used and uh, also about about using a uh, 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 flat rate of fluid in 400 dhf patient is one of possibly larger series published uh in, in in during the 2017 epidemic um so what you but uh, what i think is you should try to do, there is no limit you should try to be inside your uh proportionate fluid that is if your total uh, fluid quota is 3000 it is good if you can uh, if you are try if your chance of getting into trouble is less if you manage your first 24 hours Uh, with only half of it okay i will like can i have something yeah so uh, again so uh, main important thing is we have to somehow maintain the hemodynamics to maintenance of hemodynamics sometimes we may have to use a huge amount of fluid that's the truth but having said that uh, when you uh, when you are discussing about the Uh, indications for colloid is clearly we are mentioning that if you are thinking that you are heading towards fluid overload it's better to shift for colloid so that is why we are clinicians we have to use our clinical judgment so whenever you see that we are using huge amount of fluid within 24 hours we know that we are heading towards fluid overload so rather than giving crystalloid uh, this is an indication to give colloid because you know that you are going to exceed the fluid quota so that's the important thing somehow we have to maintain the hemodynamics i mean said that if you are if you are seen you are using huge amount of fluid that's the time to give a colloid that is why we are using colloid thank you sir um there is this question uh, during leaking phase all the parameters are normal except urine output can we give dextran bolus to maintain urine output even urine output is not increased with normal saline 10 ml per kg per hour if child is exceeding fluid quota um, so what i think uh, the question means is that uh, uh, all the parameters are normal and the urine output is the only thing that is uh, low uh, and uh, whether the extent bolus might be useful in this stage i will tell uh, chaturanga what i will do right i will tell what i will do we'll take a hypothetical situation this patient's heart rate is 80 and the pulse pressure is 40 uh, the patient uh, is otherwise all the other parameters are normal but the urine output is on only 0.2 or 0.3 or point four for the last uh, three four to two, two three hours and uh, what to do what i would uh, i i i calculate a thing called uh, what you call uh, watts or what you call volume over time scale which is not in our new guideline i hope it will come into the guideline in at least 5 uh, to 10 years time when more people realize that it's used if you if you really uh, if you have already used 90% of the fluid 
or, uh, or more than 85 to 90 percent of the fluid on the, on your fluid quota proportionately right say 24 hours so your your fluid quota is 4000 this happens at 24 hours you have already used 1800 or 1900 amount of 900 fluid or 2000 of fluid uh, then i will not give the extra i will definitely give 0 0.05 0 0.05 milligrams per kg kind of uh, very small dose of rosimide and that will probably end the issue it happens uh, in in many many occasions i don't know whether uh, this can this can happen in the ascending limb if if i am able to share i uh, shared a voice clip uh, with chaturanga 3 4 days before when i was preparing uh, where somebody from our dengue unit called me and tell that the patient is 18 hours into leaking and those things are okay and what to do. And I simply said to give, uh, give a small dose of rosemide. And then uh, three, four hours later, the, the doctor told me that the patient passes more than 100 ml of urine. And I shared the same voice clip uh, to Chaturak. I mean, I did the first one before the second one so that he could, he could see for himself that what how it works it has worked when in 500 times for me so again i can i also i think uh, the uh, you have to take the clinical decision so uh, if the child is already on 10 ml per kilo of fluid per hour with all the other parameters are all right low urine output my decision is different than if the child is on only two to three ml per kg power with no urine output with all the other parameters are all right. In that case, if you are on low, low uh, uh, amount of fluid, I will definitely increase the amount of fluid. But if I have, if I am on 10 per kilo or seven per kilo, or eight per kilo, then you have to, again, the thing is we need a catheter and the catheter should not be blocked. It has happened several times. The catheter is blocked. When I see bladder is full, uh, they are just uh, informing me the uh, no urine output. So those are, those are practical points. So if the child is in 10 per kilo fluid and no urine output, if the catheter is not blocked, yes, uh, with close observation, we can give a little bit of fusimide and see, but not always. So that's what we don't want to happen. Because whenever you see no urine output or low urine output, our tendency is to give fluosamide. That should be avoided. Thank you, sir. I think the most important thing to highlight is uh, we need to closely monitor them even after giving fluosamide. Uh, there's, there's one question. Uh, in the morning hours, can we accept low urine output since it is physiological? It's something that we commonly see. Um, Madam, would you like to answer or sir? Yes, uh, it's like the previous question, right? Uh, early hours of the morning, we tend to have a lesser amount of uh, urine, but we have to look at the clinical picture. If we are in the middle of the critical phase or something like that, it is not acceptable. But you are at the end of your leaking phase where the platelet has come down to say 30,000 or 20,000. Patient is hemodynamically stable. Other parameters are all right. You may wait and see. But if you are thinking of this patient going into critical phase started only about uh, 12 hours or 15 hours before, and now you are expecting a peak in the early morning hours, then it's not acceptable. You have to monitor the patient closely and try to maintain a good break. I think the previous question also more or less the same. The, when the urine output is low, we have to look at the clinical picture. Where are we in the critical phase? If you are at the beginning, I will not accept this sort of a urine output early hours of the morning because patient can go into shock. So at least I want to maintain the output around 0.75. 0 0.75 ml per kg. But now we are uh, about to finish. Now, yesterday's platelet count was about 30,000. Today, maybe 10 or 15. About to, I mean, patient is hemodynamically stable for last 10 hours or something with the minimal fluid. Yes, you can wait and see. Or you can try a small dose of fluosamide as we discussed before. So that is my. So I won't take it just for the urine output alone. 
I will look at the patient, how many hours into critical phase, how much fluid we are going, giving, what about the other parameters? Everything has to be taken into consideration and decide to do it, right? If end of the leaking phase or the equilibrium phase, this can be acceptable. But at the beginning or in the middle, I will not accept because I want at least a minimum of about 0.5 or 0.75. Now new guidelines is 0.75. So that is what I expect. Thank you, ma'am. There's one another question. Uh about managing a uh, small baby, so less than six months on exclusive breast uh, feeding in AM. Um, so any practical points from any of you? Yeah, uh, I think uh, usually what we do is unless there's a strong indication to stop breastfeeding, we will continue. Because the smaller the baby, the surface area is more, there is a fluid, uh, the uh, usually the volume of fluid, like 2 ml, 3 ml, even their maintenance is fairly high. So what we do is like other patients, we also start them with the 1.5 if we are in the end of, end of febrile phase, but we allow the baby to feed because usually if the baby is full, they won't take oral fluid. But if you are giving IV fluid, minimum I will give 1.5 and allow the baby to breastfeed until, you know, if the patient is close to shock for somewhere, I want the baby. And usually during that time, baby is not going to take breast milk. So it is safe provided other parameters are monitored. And if the patient is passing adequate enough urine, we don't have to worry. But if the patient is passing too much of uh, uh, urine, then we can cut down the fluid and give the breastfeeding. So it all, again, depends on the clinical judgment because sometimes infants, when they are breastfeeding, they will, if we don't breastfeed, they will continuously crying, irritable, then all our parameters may not be accurate. So allowing them to breastfeed, usually at the beginning of the critical phase or end of the critical phase is quite okay. But in the middle of the critical phase, maybe if you want an accurate fluid management, then of course, we may have to stop for a while. Thank you, madam. Uh, yeah, I Lapa can, Masa, I can add, yeah, I add, add. Yeah, I think just now I have, I said, I have two infants with DHF whom are managing. And I would say that uh, breastfeeding, unless as I fully agree with Chantini, that if a child is crying a lot, asking for uh, milk, that means the child is uh, well. In other words, uh, the I mean, you see that during the when the when the illness uh, progress, when during the the period where the uh, illness becomes more severe, uh, they they are just uh, not sucking, they are not feeding, and one of the complaints of the parents may be that they are not feeding. Then you have to stick to to IV fluids. Uh, you can give minimal IV fluids, uh, of course, as you say that they are their maintenance is also high and uh, breastfeeding is a good way in in unless there is a uh, uh, major uh, hemodynamic issue and we probably can continue uh, and let the let the babies breastfeed because the, as you say that the crying and the agitation will make all our parameters go all over the place if you don't uh, feed a uh, baby who is well enough to be feeding. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, can you vote the next question? Yes, I think the same thing. So uh, if the child can take uh, breastfeeding, I think we should allow. Uh, because uh, uh, if you think about the, any other disease, we, should, we are not stopping breastfeeding. If the child cannot take, that's a different story. But if the child can take, we have to adjust other things, IV fluids and our other uh, management uh, uh, ways of management according to the amount of fluid that child has taken. There are, there are ways of measuring uh, how much uh, fluid that child has taken. So we can do that. So we should never stop breastfeeding unless child refuses. Okay, thanks. So I think there seems to be one some confusion regarding adjusted body weight. One member is asking whether adjusted body weight in an obese child should uh, is it only applicable uh, during the critical period, or is it only for the is, is it for the entire period uh, of 
stillness i think once we start uh, calculating the fluid it is for the entire period whether it is febrile phase or the critical phase throughout because uh, we are not going to change time to time so from the beginning it's actually a continuation of the febrile phase to critical phase so there is no it's a intensive if you look at the chart more or less all the parameters are the same but only thing is it is an intensive monitoring when it comes to critical phase so the fluid management or the calculation is the same during that part of the febrile phase and the critical phase thank you madam uh... There is one interesting question. I personally have experienced the what is the management in case of low platelet and intracranial bleeding? Uh, any of our panel? Uh, yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Uh, had experience with that. Yeah, I, I will tell something. Okay. One thing you really need to understand is if there is significant massive bleeding, the bleeding. Uh, giving blood is the most important thing. But you know that coagulation needs various components. So uh, while uh, now, uh, today I, have, I, had a, I had a patient who's, uh, who became tachycardic for which I had to give blood yesterday. And then we are repeating the, 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 the blood. And uh, one of the, if the stool of heart blood is positive, there is uh, evidence that there was bleeding. I need to stop this patient bleeding. Therefore, I will, I will give cryoprecipitate. Uh, I'll give the, the important, uh, I'll try to use fresh blood that have more uh, coagulation factors, sometimes even FFP, especially when the liver enzymes are high. We have a, a series, uh, then ongoing study, where, where we show that patients with uh, high, uh, I mean, not for bleeding. For bleeding, you need to give blood but sometimes along with, now take for instance, if a patient has low platelets, platelet is one of the components that are needed for a clot formation. So if you have a significant ongoing bleeding that you want to stop, you should give uh, that patient uh, cryo, blood, and platelets if you want to stop. Yes. Uh, I also sometimes if you that. have factor seven, factor seven also. Yeah. So we all are clinicians, so we are just giving the guidance. So this is a guideline. So you can't uh, say uh, we can tell everything in the guideline. So when there is an intracranial hemorrhage, whether you are having dengue or some other disease, we have to stop that. So you need to stop. So uh, if the facilities are available, definitely we will go for the rotum. We can identify, we can correctly diagnose where the problem is and we can give whatever the blood product is. Definitely, we will take the hematologist's opinion. Uh, in This is what happens in LRH. So last week, we have managed one child with hematuria. It has not uh, settled. So we have done a rotum. So depending on the rotum, we have given FAP, cryo and platelet bone. So use your clinical judgment. So don't think that uh, dengue, uh, only blood. So yes, most of the time it's yes, but if the bleeding is massive, so you have to somehow stop that. So that's why we are clinicians. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so please note that we won't be able to answer all the questions because we are running out of time. Um, uh, there is one question, uh, uh, one member is asking, uh, during the critical phase, if you manage only with oral fluids rather than giving IV fluids, will it be more beneficial since it is more physiological and the risk of overload is less? What do you think? Can I answer? Uh, I will say that the degree of leaking is uh, always uh, varying from patient to patient. One of the things that we really need to remember is that we have already got a, a hundredfold reduction of uh, deaths from our first uh, major DHF in 1989 to date. And now uh, most countries, the case fatality rate for dengue is uh, about 1%, ours is 0.05% or, or so or less. So now if you are looking for zero mortality, I would not think uh, that we should uh, take a risk of trying to give uh, oral, but I'm sure some of the DHF patients can go through uh, the entire leaking phase. We see it because there are patients who get admitted late 
having leaked all the way and uh, now the leaking is over recovery phase by the time they come they have only be at home and taken taken uh, oral oral fluids only they did not know that they are leaking when they come we already know that platelets are rising they have got a uh, got a effusion they come with a platelet count of 20000 left sided pleural effusion patient is otherwise well hemodynamically stable you do the repeat count it is 40000 and you know that if leaking is over he has leaked at home and come so there are people who will who will have it but if we are to keep uh, we know that by admitting the patients and carefully monitoring carefully giving fluid that they can we can give them near zero mortality and with that it is not a very bright idea to try uh, the oral you remember that there is a time that the patient is uh, sleeping also right so you have to probably keep uh, waking up the patient to give oral for it also another member also has asked uh, the role of vitamin e in dhf so um you are the expert <laughs> So I you think uh, about vitamin E. <laughs> yeah. So so just to clarify, I mean, uh, so this 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 came up uh, after a study done by me and Professor Pujita Vikram Singh, where we used vitamin E in a control trial, and we found that vitamin E is beneficial in terms of reducing the duration of leaking, the recovery of the hematological parameters, as well as the liver enzymes. But um, as I understand, I mean, just the, the one study is not enough for. For us to include those that information to a guideline, but in, that's the practice in in my ward where uh, that is the university ward at Lady Jo Hospital. Um, now this interesting question. Now is it okay to use the cannula inserted at the onset of leaking for four hourly PCV measurements in critical phase? Um, I'll add my bit also because this this is something that we do in my unit. Again, um, there are two parts. One thing is it reduces the pain in the child uh, by reducing Uh, the frequent pricks. At the same time, I also uh, notice that uh, doctors, Alice, uh, as well as medical students in my unit, they don't even wear gloves when uh, taking blood from the cannula, which is actually a, a major risk for skin sepsis as well as. Uh, although we don't we don't see that frequently, but it can be a potential threat, uh, especially uh, in the light of uh, having low white cells uh, in the patient. Uh, any comment? I mean, any 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 uh, comment about yeah. you know, how long we can keep? actually in the ward we practice this and that has made a lot of uh, significant uh, improvement in the child's point of view like each time when we prick it's very painful because sometimes so using the cannula is an alternative but as dr chaturangana said uh, we need to be extremely careful about the hand hygiene and how we take the uh, specimen because i have seen sometimes people just directly this unsterile capillary tube putting into the cannula and taking blood that is not at all acceptable so if we if we maintain a good hand hygiene with the sterile measures i think it can be managed with the cannula we do it for a long time but uh, but again and again i would say uh, there is a risk of infection so unless we are very careful and if there is a fever spike or if there is some uh, extra vasation of blood outside or the uh, swab is uh, stained with blood that has to be changed but for an uh, earlier about few years ago we have been using with this finger prick and which was very painful and the patients when they leave the ward we could see most of the fingertips are blue and uh, it's more than that it is painful so even there we need to use the sterile method so we have been using for some time but uh, we did not have any problem but every day i insist on keeping sterile this place and the and the hand hygiene uh, thank you madam this this question by dr rukumar uh, any particular reason to add a target of 30 for pulse pressure Uh, at the previous guideline we mentioned that the pulse pressure should be maintained more than 20 uh, now what he is saying is that i think this is going to complicate the fluid management if we keep the target uh, in and around 30 um any comment maybe can i answer yeah i think uh, i was the one who brought this 30 into the into the practice of management 
i would say that uh, it is a if you i have kept on uh, this is this is a learning that has happened uh, managing say 50000 uh, or uh, dengue patients or dengue unit uh, alone had by said 13000 plus uh, dengue patients we noticed after some time that um, in our because we have we have a, a database of all those patients there are some 89 variables are recorded on a daily basis uh, put on as is ps chart and if you if you really look at it that the pulse pressure a normal pulse pressure of most people is uh, i say very occasionally you will have somebody whose uh, normal pulse pressure is 28 uh, but not 25 right if you take if you keep checking your blood pressure and if you have a wand if you check uh, with a proper monitor right not the audible uh, if you have a expensive you know the when you type check in blood pressure you have a blood pressure measurement equipment which is available for 5000 rupees and to 5 lakhs i'm talking about a good multiple monitor which is sensitive more than your your own hands your your fingers and if you measure your pulse pressures that i used to walk and take pictures and also see all the time that from the infant even if you have a have a infant who is uh, uh, or a new unit if you work in a new unit you will you will understand even the new units uh, pulse pressure is uh, about 30 most of the time probably you need that kind of uh, stroke volume or, or injection from the heart for you to take blood into the uh, tiny distant uh, capillaries right not just 20 so the moment the pulse pressure drops uh drops below 30 that you have uh, you are likely to compromise is is my thinking as you said it is it is not there so if you have a if you have a good multiple monitor and if your pulse pressure is uh, say 25 22 23 then that is a, that is a, a dangerous uh, situation and i've always seen that that what i what I, i mean i can only tell about my practice and i, I can only have uh, documented data for that if you are it is good to keep your pulse pressure above 30 and if you are, when your pulse pressure is between 25 to 30 for a, uh, for more than half an hour or so you need to be be thinking whether you have to increase your fluids or whether you uh, you have to sort of Uh, think of uh, intervening, and if it goes below 25, you have to intervene. And if it remains for more than half an hour, uh, between 25 to 30, you should intervene. Except in a very small number of cases where you are, uh, when you are otherwise very well, your pulse pressure may be 27, 28, but that's probably one in 500 or so. This is my experience. again uh, so if i want to add something for this one so if you think about the physiology why there is a narrowing of pulse pressure when you are having uh, low intravascular volume is uh, physiological response so we are we are increasing we are constricting the blood vessels so that your diastolic pressure will go up so that's why this pulse pressure is narrow so that's the physiology behind it so yes we know that 20 pulse pressure is our what we are uh, everywhere we are practicing but is It's like urine output. If you think about the 0.5 uh, mL per kilo urine output, below 0.5 is the dangerous area. That is why exactly why we have increased our target to 0.75. So we have some margin. If you are having a uh, less than 0.75, before it comes to 0.5, we can do something. Likewise, if your pulse pressure is 30, uh, you have to do something uh, before it comes to 20 or 25. So I think that is uh, for the safe, uh, the safe uh, practice. we have to adhere to this 30 so if it is below 30 you can't just ignore so you have to do something that's physiology that's uh, that's what we have to uh, adhere to okay thank you sir now this this one point raised by dr morel uh, perhaps we can discuss on that uh, dr morel has mentioned a patient coming in shock let's say compensatory shock We give ten ml, ten ml saline bolus, and the pulse pressure goes up to thirty. Have we got to gradually decrease the fluid to eight ml per kg per hour, six, four, like so on and so forth? And why? Shock had occurred because the preceding fluid had not been given, usually at home, and not in a hospital setting. So basically, what he asks is now, 
there had been some fluid deficit uh, gathering over time uh, when he presents. So, uh, and that deficit might be like 10 ml per kg. And you give 10 ml per kg and the patient's blood pressure restores, uh, with the pulse pressure rate uh, restores back to 30. And, you know, should we uh, gradually reduce or can't we come down to say two or three ml per kg per hour? Um, so I will answer that question because now if we think about uh, uh, that, yes. So the child is in shock. We have treated the shock with 10 ml per kilo fluid. Now child has recovered from shock. Why this child is in shock? Because there is an ongoing leaking. So it is a safe thing to gradually come down with fluid rather than drastically reduce it to 2 ml per kilo and allow the child to go into certain attack of shock. We have, we have shown you that if you, the child is getting repeated attack of shocks, the chances of developing multi-organ dysfunction is high. So you have to somehow prevent the uh, uh, occurrence of shock. That is why, it, again, it's a safe practice. So if you are gradually coming down, shock will never occur again. So that is why we have to come down gradually rather than reducing it drastically. The second thing is, it's our personal uh, experience. All the patients who have died or have uh, problems in uh, LRH ICU at this type of fluid uh, charts. So you are treating shock, but you are cutting down drastically just after managing the shock. So you are allowing this child to develop shock again. So this may be minority, but if you want to get the zero mortality, these minor points are important. Can I uh, add to the, uh, Can I sort of make my own observation? I would say that uh, that uh, I have different experience. I feel I see that there are many patients who have died of fluid overload. Uh, who come on to the tide of fluid overload as a result of keeping very high fluid rates. I don't even give, I have not given a single patient 3 ml, even 2 to 3 ml fluid for the last, uh, I would say, eight years or so. And uh, my fluid rate is 1.5 ml. And I I think Morel has this, has similar experience where we, uh, once you are, uh, once you are, he, uh, once you are given, when your hemodynamic stability is obtained at, uh, at uh, say, by giving your resuscitation, and once the pulse pressure is 30, uh, we are, earlier we were also scared to reduce it. Uh, but if Nalin says that he has seen some of these patients, his, his interpretation is that that is the reason for the patient's death. But I think you have a very good uh, close uh, big brainstorming session before you get come into to that kind of conclusions. Uh, we take, uh, if you see a very really large number of patients, that is why I say that people can tell different things based on their different experience, right? Like the numbers matter mostly. I would say that uh, that it is it is something that I've always practiced, that is after resuscitation, I go back to uh, 1.5 ml. And maybe uh, in in a in a in a very carefully uh, 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 analyzed and published and accepted to published series that we have shown that we we be able to do it and maintain uh, zero mortality in in a uh, 400 consecutive patients with DHF during the 2017 epidemic where DHF is. Uh, uh, documented with serial ultrasound scans and everything it is a it is a it is a it's an it, i mean i i really don't want to get into an argument here but i would say if i get a patient uh, even today uh, what i'm going to do is to bring it bring down uh, to to my 1.5 ml uh, after the pair special has remained for the 34 about an hour or so and everything looks okay the heart rate has come down past special has by Pulse pressure is 35, 40, and then I can I can keep taking. And if they should do this in a majority of patients, I mean, take for instance a large number of patients who come in shock. I I personally I want to tell you one thing. One of the things that we have noticed uh, in some of the studies done in Vietnam, you at LRH during the initial stage, a lot of people were telling, not like your patient, our patient have five shocks and six shocks, or there are people who describe there is a uh, there's a famous uh, uh, British uh, person who who keep taking telling about re shock. 
I would say that uh, when you're thinking about matching leaking, when you give more fluid, you leak more. And if you see, after we reduce the fluid amount of fluid that we used to give in the past to now, earlier we used to see very large effusions of the entire white, white uh, right side of the chest. We hardly see them after we have controlled our, our, our uh, fluid rates. So if you give more fluids, you will lose, and a leaking patient will, will leak more. The, why, one of the reasons why you have to reduce your fluid is, is in a leaking patient, that is one of the ways of reducing leaking. Leaking is not uh, independent of the fluid rates. Uh, I mean, whatever you give, you say, you give fluid, you leak, you leak, uh, you give. So likewise, that it becomes a vicious cycle. You can give more, you will leak more. And you can actually, the leak will slow down if you give less. That's the reason. This is an observation. This is analyzed. And that is why uh, this is not an anecdotal few patients. And this is why this patient I a kind of... Uh, kind of uh, inference, but I'm telling you, uh, I, I do that. Of course, uh, we can agree to disagree, and that's how uh, I manage my patients. Thank you. So I think I, as BJC Teresa has mentioned in the chat box, I mean, uh, very little they can be written in stone. I mean, they will be arguing, but the most important thing is that uh, we should closely monitor all, all the patients. Um, um, I think I can only allow maybe one question, maybe just a small clarification uh, from uh, Shantini, madam. The uh, one member is a little bit confused. Um, did we, uh, in, in managing uh, dengue in infancy, uh, do we, I think we are still using in, uh, 0.9 saline, right? Not N by 2. Um, so, uh, yes, normal saline. Yeah. It is normal, normal saline. saline. Yeah, normal saline is used, no, not by but uh, we can do the serum sodium and if it is very high or something, we can consider, but the Our so first guideline from, neon, by two. from neonates to adults, the recommended fluid, fluid is 0.9% saline. But if we have a problem in a neonate or, or young infant, we can check the serum sodium and if we want, if serum sodium is high, then you may consider but standard fluid is normal saline. Okay, I think uh, we are close to finishing time. And thank you so much, uh, all the listeners, uh, for the enthusiasm that you have shown and all the questions. I'm really sorry that we can't answer all the questions because of the time factor. On behalf of the College of Pediatricians, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shantini Ganeshan, uh, Dr. Lakuma Fernando, and Dr. Nalin Kitulatte. Uh, for their presentations and participating in this Q&A session. Uh, um, and thank you. And probably we can have another meeting to clarify our issues. Please send, uh, send us the feedback on the guidelines because uh, the next time we are revising the guidelines, that feedback will be very important. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. You could also, I mean, in, in my presentation, I gave my, my uh, number and uh, you may, if you have very nagging questions, you can send me on WhatsApp so that I, have give a, I will give you a written answer.